Hi, I'm Dr. David Dobson. Welcome to Conversations. Today, my guest is Dr. Olex Osiyeski. Olex is an Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation in Haskins School of Business at University of Calgary. His research and teaching interest is on strategic entrepreneurship and technological innovation. He has published many academic papers on the subject. He earned his PhD from the University of Calgary. It's a great pleasure to have you with me today, Olex. David, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be with you. Prior to joining Academia, you were involved in internet startups and management consulting. Uh, please tell me what your experience was like working in the industry. Thank you. Thank you for this question. I, I indeed came to Academia having substantial real world experience in, in, in the industry. Uh, probably for me, it all started, I, I grew up as a typical computer nerd. My first degree bachelor and, uh, and masters were in computer science. And uh, being a computer enthusiast and engineer, I, I founded my first startup back in 2003 in my undergrad years. And that startup was what got me um, to be excited about business. Um, as always, with most startups founded by engineers, it didn't go that well. Um, I learned the hard way, the basic principles of business, uh, rather than studying it elsewhere, I learned it myself. Things like, for example, if you're solving a problem for yourself, something that I did with my startup, there might not be enough industry for you. There is no, like, in my case, my startup was a success. It, it was breaking even, but there was limited possibility for growth. I also learned that this engineering mindset, you build it and customers will come, does not always work. And this kind, this experience led me to switch essentially to the dark side, to go and get my MBA from the University of New Brunswick and to make sure that I can be successful as a business, pers business person. Okay. So MBA opened up for me lots of doors. I after all this startup and experience, I, I had a very successful corporate career, being a head of strategic planning department in a large insurance company. I did lots of consulting. I, I helped to mentor, found, uh, invest in two startups. And all of this gave me all this great experience that I bring to academia. And probably going back to your initial question, what was it like working in the industry? As I am reflecting on it, I can say that real world is messy. Uh, it is very beautiful, but it is messy. Yeah. And we are all trying to make sense of it, including business leaders. Right. In academia, you have a luxury to concentrate on a small aspect of, a, of the real world, on one theory. Mm -hmm. And it is not that our theories don't work. They work really well, but they work at the same time. And if you are in trenches, running your business or managing the team, um, you don't know which theory is going to better work. And that's why I really wanted to learn more. Yeah. Um, if So if possible, let me just give you a small example, something that, that, that I have been thinking a lot. Um, in crisis times, uh -huh. Which companies are better adjusted for adaptation, are better suited for adaptation? Companies that have centralized decision-making where everything is done by CEO and management team or decentralized decision-making with autonomous units where people in the trenches who face customers can make decisions. Uh -huh. And uh, a lot of books are written about the benefits of men organizations without managers, about let your people uh, do grassroots entrepreneurial projects, that will be great. But the opposite theory that is as powerful basically says that, well, it is great that people who have knowledge make the decisions, but centralized organizations are much better in mobilizing resources and changing the course. And uh, in lots of cases, radical innovation is easier to introduce when we have one charismatic CEO that makes all the decisions. And when you are yourself in the industry, you might not always be able to step back, reflect on these contradicting forces. And that's to some extent why we need academia. But uh, real world is crucial. And I, uh, I am blessed to have, um, to, to have my hands dirty in real world before coming to academia. 
So that lets me to ask you a next question. So why did you change careers from industry to academia? Thank you. Well, um, first, I do believe that it was the best decision in my life. I absolutely love academia. And not just because academics teach and do whatever they want, but rather because for me, it is about making an impact. I really, I really believe that in in our free market economies, it is the managers, it is the executives, it is the entrepreneurs who are moving our societies forward. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to help them. I really wanted to understand how to do it right. Yeah. In my mind, when I'm thinking about it, uh -huh. if you're thinking about making an impact, if uh -huh. you are a manager or if you are an executive in organization, well, first, you are the one who does all the work. That's like, like make, let's make it clear. Value is created in, re, in businesses, in commercial enterprises, not in academia, not in government, in commercial enterprises. You make the decisions. You risk. You take risks. Yeah. But, but you're affecting one organization only. You're helping your organization. And you're learning from this organization. This is crucial, but one organization. Okay. If you want to help more, this is what, for example, veteran industry executives do. They start doing consulting. It makes all the sense in the world because now you can help five, 10, dozen organizations. Over the course of career, you can help 200, 300. But it is still quite limited to understand the, all the complexities of the world. Yeah. Next stage in terms of impact is being an educator. Uh -huh. At Haskane, as an educator, I help future business leaders. I, I help current business leaders in our executive programs. And by this means, I, maybe I'm delusional, but I hope that I can make bigger impact than, for example, as a consultant. Okay. And for final stage of this pyramid is being a thought leader or being a researcher, like true top researcher, which allows you to shape uh -huh. things in industries, in economies. And... Uh -huh. At this stage, I'm probably not there, but that's my aspiration. When you yeah. teach educators and educators teach consultants and yeah. managers. Yeah. So that, that was why, that's why I joined academia. I really wanted an impact and I felt that the best impact uh, on management practices can be done through joining academia. Of course, I, I always keep it real. I bring my own industry experience, but I, I strategically work with organizations, with executive DBA students who are, uh -huh. who are senior leaders in their organizations, who, uh -huh. who try to become thought leaders in their industries. And they make sure that I don't get too much closed in my ivory tower, nice academic office, telling everyone what to do. Uh, it's easy to say here when you're not in the trenches running your company and risking uh, okay. like, like disrupt or you will be disrupted. Uh, well, the thing is that the disruption usually does not work. And right. it is these business industry connections that I nurture that allow me to keep it real. Yeah. Uh, tell me why entrepreneurship and innovation is important for businesses to survive and thrive when operating on cost and global disruption. Well, first, I really need to say that entrepreneurship is not just about new ventures, right. technology-based new ventures or social enterprises. We all love them and we need them because they are the source of energy. They are source of rejuvenation of our industries. But we also have to understand that in market economies, um, the backbone of national economies are large established companies. They provide security in case of downturns. Yeah. They, they make most of their R&D investments, well, compete maybe with the government only. They provide uh, jobs and they move the economy forward. Uh -huh. And I am really concerned that the longevity of these large established firms uh -huh. is dramatically going down. Uh -huh. If in 1970s, a large company might expect to uh, mm -hmm. be around 50, 70 years on average. Right now, lifespan decreased to 25 years. If in 1970s, 1960s, the five-year mortality rate of, of a large public Western company, uh, the risk would be like 10%. So uh, in five years, only 10% of companies would go out of business. And in some industries, maybe 1%. Right now, it is 25 to 33%. So one-third of companies of our industry champions right now might not be in business five years down the road. Mm. And, and I do believe that one of the key problems here 
is that large organizations are really not great at stimulating entrepreneurship and innovation. And okay. well, um, large companies are large for a reason. Um, they are really great at doing business as usual, doing better what they have always been doing. So somebody, initial entrepreneur, many, many years back, uh, took a risk and established a viable business model, found a product market fit. And since that time, as the company was growing, they were just scaling it up, doing incremental, predictable improvements. So large companies are really great at doing business as usual, and that's what they have to do. Most likely CEOs of these companies became CEOs, not because they were top innovators doing something dramatically different. They became CEOs because they grew up in the ranks of business as usual, from finance or engineering or you name it. Uh -huh. But... Uh -huh. But the turbulence of global environment makes business as usual not viable. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have trends today towards deglobalization. So your supply chain might be collapsing. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you are a producer in Southeast Asia, you might not be able to get your stuff to the United States anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we have lots of disruptive technologies that are through disruptive, disruptive business models. and. Uh, uh, we have misbalances on, on financial markets, rise in short selling, lots of things happening, and it is happening faster and faster. And large companies cannot innovate themselves out of it. They, are ju they just are not suited, most of them are not suited for reinventing themselves in a disciplined manner. And that's why entrepreneurship and innovation is so important, particularly for large organizations. Entrepreneurship should not be like winning a lottery or putting high stake bets on whatever people want to do. Entrepreneurship has to be disciplined and deliberate. And that's what we can learn. We can, uh, that's what I'm learning in my research and that's what I'm teaching and that's what I'm doing in my consulting projects. It is about how to be innovative, to give reliable growth and um, longevity. There are ways to do it. So um, we study and we teach and we bring to practice how to stimulate grassroots entrepreneurship in a large organization in a disciplined manner. You cannot give every, uh, every employee that you have $10,000 at the beginning of the year and say, come to me with 50,000 at the end. No, it will not work like that. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that ideas are generated, but then the best ideas are developed and selected. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to build business cases for your ideas. But large organizations usually do not have even frameworks for building business cases. At the best, it will be some Excel table with possible budget, and that's it. How to effectively execute the best selected ideas? Uh -huh. All of these are interesting questions. And at this stage, um, management practices are frankly lagging behind what we, can, uh, what we already know from academic research. Uh -huh. So that was a little bit long answer to a question. But... <laughs> But ultimately, entrepreneurship and innovation is the way to achieve growth. And my primary goal is to make sure that this growth is reliable and is possible. Your research interest is on strategic entrepreneurship and technological innovation. What have you learned from your research? Well, of course, I have been in the field for some time and I, I, I do have lots of things to share and um, probably this, this should go beyond the scope of a single um, interview. Sure, that, yeah. that, that being said, I, I, there's a couple of points that I really would like to highlight that shows mm -hmm. what you can get out of this engaged management scholarship. So probably the first framework or insight that I would like to share with you and with listeners is um, this question that has been bugging me for, for a long time, and it became the, um, actually the basis for my own dissertation. Um, you probably heard the phrase, never waste a good crisis. So, which is totally true. If everything is going well, yeah. organizations are very reluctant to rethink their business model, their business as usual, their market. Everything is going well. When I became associate dean at Haskane School of Business, um, it was transitioning from COVID lockdowns to regular things. We were a little bit in a crisis with enrollments going like uh, uncertain. And this crisis allowed me to 
try radically new things. Yeah. On the other hand, if everything is going well, people who come with radically new ideas usually don't get support. Hmm. Uh, and um, so I, I was facing this question for a long time. Does crisis lead to innovation? Yeah. And in my dissertation, I was looking at, at different industries ranging from startups to real estate brokers to universities, large companies, nonprofits. Yeah. And uh, as always in this case, the answer is it depends, as always in the real world. <laughs> so one perspective that is empirically validated and very correct says that, well, in crisis, people are more innovative because business as usual does not work or yeah. is on decline. Opportunity cost of trying something new are lower. You have to try. Or maybe business as usual doesn't work at all. Your, custom, your customers are just not coming anymore. And you really need to reinvent yourself. That's That makes perfect sense. And we observe this. However, there is a lot of literature that shows that crisis actually leads to rigidity in thinking and in adaptation. This is the so-called threat rigidity thesis that we also observe. So in crisis, managers concentrate on extracting as much as they can from existing business model. Uh, they concentrate on conserving resources rather than trying something new. They hope that they will have enough buffer of resources to last through the crisis. Yeah. Uh, we observe this rigidity quite often. So if, yeah. if the industry is disrupted, half of the participants are going to still stick with the existing ways of doing business right. uh, just because of this rigidity mindset. Because it worked in the past and they don't want to take a risk because they don't Correct. know what the risk looks like. Correct. And also, if we add it depends factors, and some real estate brokers don't worry too much about these online brokerage models because they retire in five years. Like, I don't care. Some people, uh, well, okay, real estate brokers, that was a good example. But also, if we think about the tenure of modern CEOs, they are here for three years, five years. So they're, they, not all of them have incentives in public companies to think in the long run. And probably if you have sufficient buffer of resources, cash, you can just survive and then who, who cares? The board should care, but the board also might not fully understand this logic. Uh, yes, so sometimes it worked in the past. Large businesses are here are large for a reason. They were really good at scaling up, successfully validated business model from the past. And you became a CEO because you were really great at this. And now somebody comes to you and says, you have to completely change your way of doing business. You became a bank executive because you were so great at working with corporate clients and one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And now somebody comes and says, we are moving to FinTech era and everything is going to be online. And those startups will take away our clients. It's hard to change this mindset. Mm -hmm. So, Again, I, I try to ask this question, when is necessity, when is crisis a mother of invention or when is it a mother of rigidity? <laughs> and, and what I found by looking across different industries, across different organizations, okay. I found a common pattern. Company, so first, Okay. Crisis is important to stimulate okay. change. The best time, if you are a leader, to yeah. change is in crisis. Yeah. Now, crisis has to be perceived, not actual. So, which gives you, as a leader, a lot of uh, discretion to engage in sense making and yeah. sense giving. You can you can show to your team that yeah. now our numbers are going up, but next year we will have a collapse unless we do something now. Yeah. So, companies that really yeah. innovated mm -hmm. themselves, changed their mm -hmm. business models. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing first, they mm -hmm. perceived is, it as crisis. Whether it was act real or not does not matter. It yeah. is not, there is a really nice phrase in Edith Penrose's book of 1959 about theory of organizational growth. She says, essentially, it is not the external environment per se, but rather the image of external environment in the entrepreneur's world that forces, mm -hmm. stimulates change. So yeah. through sense-making and sense-giving as a leader, you can, you can energize your team for thinking about what can be changed. Yeah. So that's first, yeah. but there are two more things. Mm -hmm. Second thing is having enough time to think, not to implement the decision, but actually to think. Mm -hmm. If you, 
if you call an emergency meeting saying that we have to radically innovate our business model and we have 30 minutes to make this decision, most likely people will think that you're crazy. Even if you are CEO, they, they might agree, but ultimately they, they, will, they are not going to think innovatively. So you need to give people enough time to fully understand that the crisis is here and to come up with yeah. innovative solutions in their area of expertise. Yeah. How much is this time? Well, we are not talking about years. We are talking yeah. about weeks, but yeah. don't call an emergency meeting unless you have yeah. a crisis today. So having enough time. And third thing, probably most important. We as humans do not tolerate uncertainty well, most of us. We have a small number of entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs among us who thrive on uncertainty, but most of us need certainty and predictability. Right. So as a leader, yeah. you have to create a sense of predictability of situation. Mm. Yes, we are in crisis, but this is how the environment is going. This is how the things are mm. going to unfold. And let's think about how we can adjust to it. Mm. Now, you might have no clue about what's going on there, but you have mm. to project a mm. sense of predictability. You have yes. to formulate a mission for your organization yes. through stories, through sense giving. You have to do it. Yeah. So again, just in summary, does crisis lead to innovation? Well, it depends. Uh, it leads to innovation if people feel that it is crisis. Second, if they have enough time to make decision. In urgency, lots of psychological mechanisms turn on and we get stuck in rigidity. If I have to make the decision right now, I will continue doing what I have always been doing. That happened with universities, for example, in March of 2020, when we had to switch to online education right away. We didn't have time to think Overnight, essentially, we didn't have time to think about what it means for our business models. Yeah. Uh, can we actually get any upside for, when everyone is switching to online? Well, everyone is in the same boat. It allows us to experiment. But because yeah. it was done so quickly, uh, yeah. most universities didn't generate innovative solutions and bounced back to in-person teaching once yeah. lockdowns were done. Right. And third thing, project the future explain yeah. to people what is going yeah. to happen in the future, yeah. even if the, you have no clue what it is. Yeah. So this is one of those frameworks that yeah. I developed and that yeah. I do believe are quite powerful in mm. executive training, for example, when mm. developing strategic leaders. Yeah. How, how to make your people innovative? Yeah. Why? Or how does it yeah. happen that I'm the only one who is yeah. entrepreneurial in my organization? Yeah. Well, take a look at... Um, yeah. So this is uh, one of those insights that came from my yeah. scholarship. And of yeah. course, it is reflected in, in a bunch of papers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and if I am, uh, can add a little bit more here. So um, ultimately, I discussed what can you do as a leader in order yeah. to stimulate entrepreneurial thinking of your team yeah. or yeah. innovation within your team. But also as a social science researcher, I have to yeah. say that innovation yeah. for the sake of innovation is useless. Like you, you cannot just, um, if innovation doesn't make sense, if there is no business case for it, well, just it is a waste of resource, yeah. resources of yours, shareholders, um, society. Yeah. So the, another interesting question is when and what kind of innovation works? Right. And if we talk about crisis context, together with my great colleagues, we studied, we, we wrote a few academic papers looking at hundreds of companies. And we asked a question in crisis, does it make sense to innovate? Does it make yeah. sense to be to engage in exploration of new right. things as opposed yeah. to exploitation of what you're currently doing? And the answer is definitely yes. Well, predictably, in crisis, business as usual will decay, which means that exploitation of what you have, even small minor improvements, they lead to reliable performance decline. So if you're sticking to business as usual in crisis, it all goes down, but reliably. Right. Now, if you try crazy entrepreneurial things, uh, new markets, new products, new ways to reach your customers. If you are a restaurant, there are lockdowns and you, uh, you try to reinvent yourself as like delivery business. Uh, on average, this does not work. Mm -hmm. On average, uh, or no, let, let me put like that. I will say differently. So okay. first, it accelerates the risks, increases the risks. So mm -hmm. in crisis, entrepreneurial exploration 
does increase the risk. The mm -hmm. variability distribution, the, dis the variability of the distribution of outcomes mm -hmm. widens, mm -hmm. but also on average the performance improves. So again, I proved that in crisis you, you, is the best time to do something, which is yes. quite trivial. But yeah. also, what I was able to show is that if you are using our entrepreneurship principles, like effectuation, uh, something the way serial entrepreneurs are thinking, affordable loss principle, so risk only what you can and treat every, every new project as an experiment. If you are flexible, if you are getting pre-commitments from your partners and clients, right. you can actually almost eliminate the risks. You can, you can achieve reliable performance improvements if not just that you are doing crazy entrepreneurial things, but you are doing them in a disciplined manner. And this is totally applicable to large organizations as well. Affordable loss principle, partnerships, pre-commitments, flexibility, experimentation, all of these things have to be incorporated in your innovation practices. Yes. And I have evidence that shows that they work. They lead uh -huh. to reliable performance improvement. Uh, that's, that's the social science at its best. Great. You supervise doctoral students. Do you have any advice for doctoral students on how to finish their thesis, the final milestone in their doctoral journey? Beautiful. Thank you. So let, let, let's talk about this. This this. Well, yes. So first thing first, um, I supervise quite a lot of doctoral students and probably this is that part of academic uh, duties that I like most. So if I, if I have only six months more to live, the only thing I would do is make sure that my doctoral students are on the right trajectories. Right. That's first. Second, we really have to distinguish between traditional PhD doctoral students mm -hmm. who are here to become future academics right. and executive PhD students or DBA, yeah. Doctor of Business Administration students, yeah. who are already established leaders, executives in their industries, who are on the path to become thought leaders, to move beyond their organization to industry or economy level to shape management practices. Okay. And, um, but regardless of the type of doctoral program you are doing, my advice is actually the same. Uh, there are no perfect dissertations. There are finished and unfinished dissertations. Uh, and having a PhD doesn't indicate, indicate just that you are smart. It also indicates that you are disciplined, that you can get the project done, despite all the things that happen in your life over the course of four or five years. Yeah. Of course, our PhD students, uh, this is that time when they get promoted, they get married, some of them get divorced, some of them get kids. It's like lots of things happen and you have together simultaneously with your full-time job, you have to deliver, develop your thought leadership. Okay. So the key point here is the following. Hmm. It is relatively easy to navigate the first part of the doctoral program, the structured period. Any doctoral program would have structured part and unstructured part. Yes. Structured part means you take your courses, three, four, eight, 12, whatever is the structure of your program. Uh -huh. And then you do candidacy exams and write thesis yeah. proposal. Yeah. All of this is simple, not easy, uh -huh. but simple. There is no ambiguity yeah. there. Here is the program, here is the schedule, just do it. Uh, the, tricks, yeah. the tricky thing happens once you're done with all this structured part and uh -huh. you're on your own writing your dissertation. Right. This is where you feel lonely and isolated because you're not part of the cohort anymore. Yes. You're working just with your supervisor yeah. and some supervisors are more engaged than others. Uh -huh. um, this is where you have to navigate all the challenges essentially yourself. Yeah. And this is where programs usually lose their students. Uh -huh. Programs, doctoral student programs that have thesis component. There are doctoral programs that do not have it, uh, but doctoral programs that have thesis component, uh -huh. including our own, we require students to write a dissertation, which is an independent piece of scholarship and contribution to management practice. So in order to navigate this unstructured period, three points. First, always keep your eyes on the prize. You are here to become a thought leader in your industry. Uh, 
you are going you are here to make our companies better never forget about it you're here ultimately not to write a dissertation you you will do it and you will get your doctoral degree that's simple part you are here to improve management practices keep your eyes on the prize okay. second thing is write systematically if you want you can think systematically or not we are all great thinkers we joined academia because we have this high need for cognition we are intellectually curious but successful people are those who write systematically. There is no alternative to it. Uh, it is very easy to navigate through your ideas in your mind. But once you sit in front of an empty uh, Word document and you have to write an introduction to your essay, yeah. this is where hard work comes. And wow. chat GPT is going to help you only so much. Well, first, yes. it is not always possible but and allowed and ethical, but in general, yeah. Chat GPT or any other generative AI technology uh, cannot substitute putting your ideas on the piece of paper. Right. And finally, mobilize your support network. Your supervisor, your committee are here to support you. Uh -huh. They support in different ways and it might come in different forms, but they, yeah. they joined your committee for a reason. Yeah. We never force anyone to supervise a student. It, like there, there is an intrinsic interest to support you. Uh -huh. Work with your prior cohort that navigated through structured part of the dissertation with you. Uh -huh. All of this, make sure that you are not alone. All of this, will ensure that you will do it on time. Now, will you do it in three years, four and five? It is. It depends on your life and on how disciplined you are in writing, but also lots of things happen in life. But mm -hmm. keep your eyes on the price, write systematically and mobilize support network. That's my recipe for successfully finishing the doctoral dissertations. Thank you for your time, Olex. Have a great rest of your day. David, thank you so much.